I only have to read do these when I'm reading my script. And I know it flares. Yep. Which hey, is everybody. Why, which is why I wear this. <laughs> <laughs> hey, everybody. This is uh, Uncle Matt's d, &D Neighborhood. And um, we're doing the top five DM tips that uh, we've done with a couple people. So for, uh, for a special and highly lethal treat, uh, I've brought in Tim Cask to get his five. And I think he's probably familiar with everybody. Um, but just in case, he is the editor of the, uh, he was the first editor of the Dragon Magazine, was the first uh, real employee of TSR Inc. He did the editing on um, uh, most of the original D&D supplements, was uh, kind of the midwife of uh, first edition um, advanced D&D that came out, plus many other uh, uh, achievements at the beginning uh, of the very birthplace of Dungeons and Dragons. So, um, <laughs> make me feel old now. <laughs> <laughs> I just had a birthday. <laughs> and then he did lots of shit later on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did. Yeah, out of magazines and stuff. Yes. So um, let's let's go ahead since we've got our, our top five DM tips from uh, from Tim. Go ahead. Let's talk about what your first one is. First one's easiest. One word, fun. If you're not having fun, you're doing something wrong. Now, why you would persist in doing something that you're not having fun at, you're either a masochist or you've been sentenced to some sort of mental torture. We're all here to have fun. The DM's got to have the most fun in some regards because if it isn't a lot of fun for him, he's not going to justify that enormous amount of work he puts into preparing everything. And that was one of the things that was key also in the first edition DMG that Gary pointed out, you know, a, a lot about that, that the, the, the DM is, uh, you know, often harassed um, mentally, not by the players. Um, and, uh, you know, the, so there was the, the consideration about that. But I don't really remember Gary ever specifically emphasizing that one about fun. Well, all Gary's games had fun, whether it was Gary having fun at our expense or we were all having fun together. Uh, but, In other words, he had a kind of a self-help remedy if he wasn't having well, yeah, fun. I, you know, well, all DMs have, you know, but I think what you're talking about is the pressure that becomes, uh, oh, you know, how can I kill these people that we've been playing together for seven months? And it, it, becomes, a, it becomes a real burden um, if you don't remember that you're there to have fun, you aren't there to invest your entire psyche into this made up adventure, nor are they here to invest their entire psyche in this made up character. You got to have fun. You got to lighten up. You got to laugh once in a while. There's nothing wrong. We used to laugh ourselves silly. Uh, back in the really old, the really old days. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I started out by making you feel old. <laughs> All right. Hey, uh, two years ago when I was diagnosed, uh, who knew I'd be here to celebrate my 70th? So I'm going to do a special uh, curmudgeon tonight called Six Score and Ten. Now, and what he's talking about with curmudgeon, just in case people don't know, um, is that Tim has a show called uh, Curmudgeon in the Cellar, and it's over on. Uh, my featured channel's over there, so it's a one-click button away from here so that you can watch that uh, when he does it. Oh, yeah, and if you're a new subscriber, I'll even make sure you get a new set of free set of dice. How's that? <laughs> Very <laughs> cool. Anyway, Gary was there to have fun, and he kept reminding us, hey, it's supposed to be fun. It's supposed to be fun. Now, fun for a DM is thinking up wicked traps and, and devious deceptions and posing wonderful riddles. It doesn't have to be fun seeing them die, seeing them ooze out from underneath that enormous stone block that just <laughs> fell on them, like like pate. No, I mean if you're if that's the way you're getting your fun, you're <laughs> you need to speak to somebody other than me and Matt here tonight, okay? <laughs> but if you're not having fun, you shouldn't be doing it as a DM because you gotta you gotta laugh. You gotta laugh at yourself when they fox you. You got to laugh at them when you fox them. You got to be ready to laugh at yourself when they figure something out that you thought was just the most devious thing you ever came up with in your whole devious life. And they just waltz through it like there's Steve Martin doing the Egyptian dance. Um, you got to be able to laugh when that stuff happens. 
and they got to be able to laugh when silly, silly stuff should happen. There's the people that don't think there's any room in, in role playing, particularly fantasy role playing for silly, just haven't watched enough Monty Python. Yeah, I, I the, the, and there's an interesting point about this too because when when we were on the phone, um, when I called you about doing the interview and and you said you know the the number one is going to be fun. See, I've been putting together my list of top five, which probably won't ever hit the air, but because I do all these things through interviews, but I've done two interviews already, and neither of the two interviewees put that, I don't think, even in their top five. And for me, that's the number one as well, is have fun, because it drives everything. It's the DM's fun and personality that creates the lead for how everyone else is going to be. I mean, if you're sitting there grim-faced... Um, then so will they exactly and if you sit there spouting stuff that they have no clue what you're talking about they're going to sit there with the worst face you can possibly get at the table and that's six or seven blank stares yeah exactly <laughs> so they have no idea what just happened or what you just said and and again if back in the day when i used to write on threads and stuff uh oh god there's a huge thread over in dragon's foot that's been locked for a few years now I, you know, everybody got into clever signatures at the bottom. And and one of mine from the very beginning was, if you're not having fun, you're not doing something, you're doing something wrong or you're not doing it right. And it goes right along with rulings, not rules. Because fun is, is fudging once in a while and deciding, now nah, I'm not going to look that up. This is the way it works tonight. Yeah. Because, I mean, let's face it, we're playing fantasy, but after all, oddball crap happens to us in real life all the time <laughs> you know, it does and so some oddball crap hum okay let it go you know it's fine but let me ask you since you're talking about that do you make a uh, a difference between the lower level characters and the higher level characters because when i'm running low level characters all kinds of wild stuff uh goes wrong with them and i'm a, I'm a lot uh, less likely to put in uh, you know, the worst possible result when they're higher level. Do you do that or is it just straight on, you know, whatever well, happens? In my case, when I'm writing an adventure for a specific level, I try to make it, I'm trying to make the challenge commensurate with the level. Nowadays, I'm running this whole different thing called the Wheel of Blame. And it's um, real basic OD and D, pre gens given out. Everybody writes down two things on a on a note on a note card that I give them and a pencil if they didn't bring one, and they give me five minutes. I look through the note cards. The adventure starts here, and I work all those things in. And so you got to figure there's going to be a whole lot of laughter. Yeah. And after my cancer, not to sound maudlin or anything, I decided while I had certainly deserved my TPK reputation, earned it, I was going to go for laughs. And uh, instead of trying to kill everybody now, I try to make sure everybody goes out with sore sides from laughing, or at least as once has cracked a smile. Even the most dour player sitting over there across the table from me, I'll make them smile at least once. And that's my fun. And in so doing, hopefully, it's their fun too. And it, it goes to your weekly campaign. Same thing. If you're not having fun, why the hell are you getting together every week or every two weeks? Or, you know, why are you giving all those hours of your life? As a DM particularly, you're given many, many more hours. I can't say, I can't praise highly enough. People should read Jolly's Knights of the Dead Table. If you read some of those, get some of the yes, old bundles of that, trouble. That's well, how you see yourself. Hours. You see yeah, yourself. Oh, not, that. Yes. That's his, that's Jolly's, his, his, absolute gift um just look what poor old uh dm in his game goes through again and and, and he, he puts in all these hours and they foil him they turn him around in that but if he wasn't having fun he'd keep going back he has to admit it to himself he's he's still enjoying it and if you can't admit to yourself that you're enjoying it then you gotta shake it up change the game for a couple of weeks play a different system for a couple of weeks you know, role playing's got so many diverse things out there. Go be a mutant. You know, uh, go be a robot. Um, well, that's in know. real life being a robot. <laughs> <laughs> well, so luckily, I don't have any prosthetic parts yet, but some friends that we know have 
increasing number of prosthetic parts as they age and parts fall off uh, or, or, or don't work anymore. But anyway, um, yeah, fun, fun's first and foremost for me. Um, I wouldn't go to all these cons at my age if I wasn't having fun making people laugh. If I wasn't having fun, you know, signing stuff for people, posing for pictures because, you know, it makes them happy. That's my fun. Yeah. Make them laugh at the table. Be nice. I know it doesn't bode, doesn't fit well with my curmudgeon, but <laughs> I'll, still do, I'll still do a rant every now and again. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll Andy Rooney and uh, I'll keep that. But that's all I got to say about number one is it's okay. fun. All right. Now, um, we've got Ruben Pop has asked a question um, about whether you've got a favorite segment of history to draw from. But Ruben, we're going to put that off a little bit um, because I want to see whether something like that crops up in Tim's later tips, because I don't actually know what they are. Um, we're, we're doing this totally uh, off the cuff. I know. Yeah, he told me to pick out five things this afternoon. I said, OK. So I wrote down a list while I was having a sandwich. And <laughs> here they are. Yeah, it's 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 uh, it's it's totally totally. Actually, I'm, I'm actually I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go that way. So I can answer this one very briefly. Okay, all right. Um, I'm still rooted in a sort of a fantastical medieval thing. However, my later writings, I've gotten into um, I've gotten into uh, North and South America in the uh, pre-Columbian period. I'm I'm doing I'm developing a whole series of adventures that take place in pre-Columbian. Um, North and South America. Um, I'm just a history nut. I, I just lap up every kind of history at the trough I can find. But I still where I do my fantastical stuff is kind of a medieval setting thingy with serfs and peasants and pe owing lords obligations and that and makes it easy. Yeah, it's, so, it's definitely easier. Having said all that crap, keep it simple. That's my number two. All right. Keep it simple. Talk about that. Well, first off, if you are if you got newbies, keep it simple. If you're getting newbies into the game, give them the six numbers, the big six, right? And tell them stuff like, eh, this first one here is strength or whatever the number is in the system you use. That's how big a rock you can pick up. And dex, eh, that's what you can hit with that rock. And, you know, and, 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 you know, stuff you can jump over. Just real simple. And you got him running. I, 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 I've used this example before. It was all ladies that had never played from my wife's Zumba group. And they said, well, you run an adventure fine. And I had him running down the trail literally inside of 10 minutes. I gave him a sheet with the six numbers on him. I gave him a real brief. Here's an intelligence. Wisdom is, is smarts, is street smarts, not book smarts. Yeah, endurance. And they're all they're all Zumba people, so they all had high endurance ratings, you know, or, you know high uh, high constitution ratings. So I gave them all that, and I made them all members of this uh, this uh, sort of a semi religious, semi physical fitness nuts that all uh, fought with staffs. And ten minutes later, we we're running down the, the trail looking for those nasty bugbears who stole our sacred bell. You know, there's four a hours later, I had eight role players. Yeah. You know, because there's a great list easy. when you're talking about the big six, there's a great list um, based on a tomato. Have you seen that one? That strength is the ability to crush a tomato. Dexterity is the ability to hit somebody with a tomato. Wisdom is um, when not to uh, do it. It's wisdom, wisdom is when not to throw a tomato. Uh, intelligence is knowing that a tomato is a fruit. No, intelligence is knowing that tomato is a yeah, intelligence is knowing that a tomato is a fruit, and charisma is the ability to sell a tomato uh, as fruit salad. <laughs> no, I hadn't seen that, but I like that. I like that. Somebody can send me that meme one day <laughs> or that list, and uh, yeah, I can I can enjoy that. Yeah, because I'm sure I didn't get it exactly right. Well, no, but but the gist of it is certainly there. But but the, the fact you know, keep it simple. That's with newbies now. If you got guys that uh, and got, when I use the word guys, I'm 70 years old. It's a generic for males, females, undecideds, trans, LGBTQ, what, however many. I, I'm not trying to offend anybody by you my. You got the right. You got the right phrase anyway. It's, I think. I think it's guys. So okay. You know. Um. What, what you know. You you 
you get you you just keep it simple. You you got new guys learning to play the game, and you uh, my next point hinges on this first one. You keep it simple to get it going, to get them interested, to get them to sit up at the table, not slouching back and doodling. And if you keep it simple to start, that's with newbies. Now, all right, I'm going to run an adventure at uh, uh, North Texas RPG Con. Back in the day, I used to write adventures for them. So I would I would try to write what I was always told was too much of a, okay, here's the backstory you need to know. Now we're going to go try to run through this adventure in four hours that I really wrote for three or four nights of play. Yeah. <laughs> so you got to boil it all down to, okay, this is what we're going to do in these four hours. You got to simplify that. And you got to present it as simply as you can and then get into the involvement. Don't get into the, uh, the crazy, uh, what I call niche rules or niche numbers. Uh, don't don't get into that kind of stuff right away. I abhor skills and abilities, you know, capital A, capital S. I abhor those. I think those are things that are picked up along the way and kept note of on their character sheets. And um, by keeping it simple, you don't bog people down in die rolls and uh, and all that kind of stuff. And you keep the combat simple. I've always used a very simple... 10 round seg, you know, 10 six second segments. I've used that from the very beginning. We thought it up. And it's the fastest bam, 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 bam. And again, this also hinges on the on the third point that I'm gonna bring up tonight. Okay. And you know, before we before we get to that, let me ask yeah. about the description too, in terms of keeping things simple that I think is maybe um, you know, you were talking about skills and abilities. <clears throat> but the capital S, capital A, yeah, capital S, capital A. Um, yeah. But um, if if the way that you approach it, and and I think I do this in convention games, is um, you give a very very basic description. You enter a room, there are tapestries and a chair, and then it is going to evolve as people do things with the tapestry and the chair that will eventually end with up with them burning the tapestry, most likely. But you know. <laughs> Well, <clears throat> what I do when I when I prepare an adventure such as this, I basically allow for all the things they might do in the write up for the DM, and I try to. Now, God knows every DM that's ever DM'd and is not a, a, a liar at the core of his or her soul <laughs> will tell you that we do strange. And, and unusual things as DMs, and um, I just I, I try to make it so that my next thing again is wh why the the you got to keep the game rolling, and if it's not simple, it gets bogged down. And simple also means speedy. I guess is where I was going with that. Simple plays faster. Ten rounds, everybody rolls a ten-sider. Ones go, twos go. What do you do? What do you do? What do you do? What do you do? People are astonished when the, uh, when they ask me about um, how many combats did we used to have in a four or five-hour session session back in the day, and I tell them, I don't know, eight, ten, twelve. Depends on what we ran into that day. Yeah. Whereas I understand some of the later editions, if you, you, a, an encounter took the evening. Oh, you know, well, go shoot, go play pinball, go play video games, <laughs> you know. Um, so um, simple is also fast. Fast and simple create my third one, involvement. Okay. What are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? If it's a brand new group that you've never run before, you'll always find quiet people around the table. They don't feel like competing. After a little while, you'll hear them talking to themselves more often than not about what they think the group ought to do. And when yep. you hear one of them get it right, what was that you said? The whole group will turn to them. They'll shine. And generally, you only got to do it once, sometimes twice to another person, and then pretty soon the group's working. And now they are involved in the collective mind. And seven minds, seven collective minds on the other side of the screen for me 
I would need 12 to fight them equally if I didn't have everything already prepared. <laughs> yeah. You know, I would need 12 minds because that hive mind is the most wonderful thing to see function when it comes to life. When you get that involvement in a group, you've seen it. I've walked by games. You've got 22 people in there. Every one of them staring at you because you're standing up on a chair giving directions like a stage director and you've got them involved. You, you know what I'm saying. Same thing whether you got five at the table. What was that you said? Well, what do you think we ought to do? And you might find a really, really good player get their confidence and all of a sudden um, there was an episode many years ago in North Texas where um, somebody wasn't uh, welcome to play in a game and I made sure that that person was welcome to play in mine and that person ended up being a joy and a very productive member of the party because I let them go yeah okay and um i can see where that person might be a distraction for other people but at hell i've taught school for many years in many kinds of classes and so um that person got truly in, in involved and kind of um came out of their shell that that year and i made a lifelong friend as well so you know it was double win-win that's awesome um, but if you get the group involved they're they're not going to want to take a break uh even if you do i have to go out and smoke you tell them all right we're taking a break so then they might realize that the last three sodas they guzzled might need to be relieved so but um if you get them involved the time flies and they start thinking of things that you had no way of foreseeing or planning against which is great because now you as the dm are challenged to think on your feet and now you're, it's fun again for you. Now, there's actually two types in, of involvement that I thought of while you were talking because you touched on both of them. One of them, um, <clears throat> one of them was the sort of involvement that you were talking about when I'm doing the sort of you know theater of the now. You also describe you know um, where there's the stuff over here and I'm up on a chair and so people are paying attention to me. But there's also um, which you have to. Be conscious of switching in and out too. Is the involvement between the players themselves? Because when you're talking about how they're going to come up with a, a solution to a problem, that's not going to come from um, the sort of theater that you're doing as a DM. That's coming from them cross talking, which is also a relatively difficult thing to get going. What's your? How do you get them talking to each other? probably old school teacher techniques <laughs> i don't even know if i get it i don't even know how many of them i still use um well i'll call the table to order at the very beginning and, and right after we get our feet wet i'll call them to order again and i'll remind them and um i let them know at the beginning that okay i know all your characters abilities because they're all pretense i know them so no, I want to know who's watching the back, which guy goes into the room. You don't have to tell me you're searching first this wall, that wall, this wall. Who's the guy looking? I know your skills. I'll say, oh, by the way, as you were coming in, Bob, yeah, there's something about that northeastern corner of the wall that caught your eye. Something odd there. Now, they didn't have to go around and make a roll on every wall. Okay, I speeded it up considerably by doing that but now everybody's looking at bob and if everybody's got a skill that i can find and i can call them out once on their skill they're talking they're, they got their heads together it happens very quickly at some uh some cons i've been to especially the first time you burn them <laughs> yeah. Well, I, you know, I, I think them, but just burn them, you know. I, I think a lot of the cons, there's usually at least one person who's a uh, a sort of leader personality, whether they're uh, whether it's because they're really experienced or because they're an asshole. You know, you get that too. But um, when I get the assholes, I I make sure that I find somebody else that takes over for the asshole. Yeah, I start going. Well, what do you think? 
What do you think? And eventually the asshole gets the idea and he kind of see it recedes into the back. Yeah, because I'm not really talking about somebody who's an asshole asshole. Just, you know, somebody who's a very aggressive personality. Right. Um, and you can. And, and, and you I know, don't you like them, but I like this other person. I will encourage this other person. And let's be honest, at a con, there's likes and dislikes. I try to love everybody that sits at my table. Within an hour, <laughs> that's falling apart. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it's, that's the best thing is when it all just falls the hell apart. <laughs> I hate them all. <laughs> or I love them all. You know, I, I did a group. I think it was last year at Total Con. I did a group of this new weird game I'm doing. And my God, we were in one of those fishbowl rooms out in one of the main hallways. And people were asking us for days what was going on there because every time we walked by, we were just howling with laughter. They were doing the weirdest things. And yeah, okay, let's see what the dice says. And we were playing true old school. Yeah, that's got about a half ass chance of working. Oh, well, must have worked. And so I let the dice roll. And that is also another part of one of my points much later. Okay. Now let me, uh, let me check on, um, I've got yeah. a question from the chat room. Let's see whether it's one you're going to cover. Um, Pokemon four W O T, um, has I already uh, lost two points of respect right there. <laughs> Pokemon anything. Uh, but anyway, he's asking whether, um, he's asking how, uh, how the two of us prep for adventures. And is that something that you're going to cover? Do you want to talk about that now, or should we put that off? Well, I, I got a real quick answer for that. Um, I either write them. Okay, I've done that 11 times. I've written adventures, four cons. And so uh, the prep was in the writing. Or the ones I do now, I do no prep beyond printing pre-gen sheets. Because the ones I do now, I do absolutely on the spot ad lib. I first watched Frank doing it. Then I saw Jim doing it one day. And I said, well, hell, I can do this. And I like to think I, did, I do it in my own way now. But these new games I run are completely ad lib on the spot. I challenge them. Come on, put some neat things on these cards. Give them to me. And I'll turn them into, and we just go on this adventure, and it's an absolute railroad game. Everybody's got to get a key or a cat's eye or, you know, whatever I make up for that game. Each one has to get one at each encounter for this for them all to get out, or they must go around the wheel of blame forever and ever and ever and ever. So, and then the wheel, the blame part comes in at the end of the game. I read through the cards, and they all get to point at each other. You, you did that to me. <laughs> and so we have about a 20 minute blame session. Everybody walks out laughing and happy. So that really, I mean, your prep goes back into the very first point that you made is that it's part of the fun and, the, and that you're doing it with the ad lib. Yeah, um, the ad lib is, I, I got caught one time. I got caught at a total con with a Sunday game that somebody in, in, in every, I had brought three or four new adventures and in the Sunday game, there was somebody that had played in every one of them. Mm -hmm. I was screwed. <laughs> so I had this big map that I'd made up of this monster city that I've been working on first in another gaming platform, a game called age of wonders. And um, I, I always carry that around and I know what's in this part of the world and that's part. So I said, Oh yeah. Okay. Here I found something. And this is the first time I tried this crap. And so I pulled this map out and I set up the screen and everything. And I told him, all right, all you guys got hired to guard this warehouse. And um, it's got all these, you know, seemingly impregnable. <laughs> no, it wasn't. And those shiny new gold coins that you're in your pockets and your pouches and your purchase won't come out of your pockets or your pouches, pouches or your purses. And in 36 hours, they're going to blow your legs or whatever other part they're near off unless you retrieve these goods. And I let them loose on the city. Mm -hmm. I let them find the tunnel that was dug up underneath. That's how they got around the wards. And these dirty little hobbit thieves guild had broken in and stolen the last barrel of long bottom leaf. And so they followed out through the tunnel, came out in the caravanserai. Here's this enormous city awaiting them. And off they went. Where? Okay, where are you going? Where are we going over here? Where are you going? By the time I get over to here, hey, you didn't find anything. Well, you found. And so I made it up along the way. And I'm having so much fun. 
making this shit up, excuse me, making this stuff up as I go along the way. They're all just eating it up because they are all contributing. Because I'm, you know, I had like nine players, so they're all going out in twos and threes to the various parts of the city looking for this, looking for that. They found the stuff. They beat the, hob, the, the hobbits. They ran through the city with this hugely obvious thing on their shoulders in broad daylight. Past two city patrols and two imperial patrols. I couldn't get a giant roll to notice them. And they got back and they kept their legs from being blown off. And I flipped over the screen and they saw there was nothing behind there. And they all just went, huh? <laughs> and I went, yeah, that was fun, wasn't it? I think I'll to do that again one day. And so that's when I decided I could do that. And that's how you get involvement. Everybody's doing something. Um, before we go in on a con adventure, I want the marching order. Who's in front? Who's in back? Who's watching the back? Who's looking for traps? Who's going in and looking for secret doors? You know, I want all that stuff in advance. Five minutes before the game, when you know that stuff, you'll save 20 minutes of gameplay later on. No, no, who was doing that? No, no, it hit number three in line. Okay, you'll save that time later because you, you made them give you the marching order right there. Yep. And if you're going to be out doing overnight stuff, you give them your watch order. And then I do simple stuff like if you get two uninterrupted uh, uh, periods of sleep, as a, as a magic user, you get full replenishment. If you only get one, you get two-thirds replenishment. And if you don't get any, you don't replenish at all. It's always the magic users that get to sleep all the way through the night. Everybody's you hope. <laughs> you, hope. <laughs> you hope. But occasionally, hey, when you just lob stuff into the camp, sometimes a magic user gets hit. Dice. You know, old schools. Roll the dice and see who it hits. Yeah. Now, uh, comes out of the sky. Who did hit? And since uh, since uh, Pokemon Four WT also asked how I prep for games, mine is a little bit more than um, what Tim does. I I have the map, um, but on the map I have um, mostly for uh, for things. I'll have like an arrow drawn to it, and it'll be like things thing with wheels. And then I'll figure out what the thing with wheels is, um, usually when they get there. Um, and then um, I've either got monsters written on there for certain places or else I've just got uh, a table um, that I roll on. Because the problem is when you do, since I run a large mega dungeon over and over again with the players able to share the maps and gain experience and so on, if I... Um, right in orcs at, at every place where there are orcs uh, it means i have to go back through and scratch them all out again um, <laughs> yeah who needs that right right put in new stuff and so that by using tables um i'm, I'm just able to sort of generate uh what's going to be in there well, i was looking for i have a little map that i made up for that uh women's adventure that i did for my wife's all her friends i did it on a half sheet of paper it was yep the road and where it ended and then along the way what we are and that's all you needed keep it simple keep it simple that's all i had and so they that's all they had to figure out and that's all they had to learn how to copy we're going south mostly all the time you know right. and so i kept it real simple and they got involved paying attention let's and go so, on to your let's go on to your fourth um deal not everything yeah. has to be killed <laughs> All right. Okay. When I DM, and if you've got a, uh, you know, if I put a couple of ogres somewhere, and you can figure out a way to completely immobilize the ogres, and you have them at your mercy, and you could kill them or not if you choose, and you choose not to, I don't care. I'm still going to give you credit for taking out two ogres. It's beating the challenge, not killing it's the monster. It's the challenge, not the meat. All right. It's really what it is. Um, that's why I, I never liked, never from the very beginning, the whole time I was at TSR, I did not give experience points for gold. You did not? I gave experience yeah. points for killing stuff, and I gave experience for it for doing things, figuring stuff out. Oh, you disarmed that trap. Well, that's worth 150 points. And um, you figured out a way to get around, you know. So I gave I gave experience for feats of daring do or thinking outside the box. I thought it was hideous if you just happened to, especially back in the early days when we were following the rules and rolling up these ridiculous dungeons with just 
literally smug sized mounds of treasure because the dice said so. Yeah. And you're now a first level that goes in and somehow you manage to kill the one goblin that the dice said was all that was guarding it. And now you're a 37th level, whatever you want, because you know that was stupid. But I always gave points for thinking outside the box. I gave points for general performance. Everybody take an extra 250 points today. You were on the ball. You know, or whatever number was appropriate to the levels that they were achieving. You know, if, if they were way up in the stratosphere, and I'm talking about, you know, high-level characters, which I don't run that often, well, then I'd bump the numbers up to be commensurate. It's like playing pot farm on 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 Facebook, and you get <laughs> you get three seeds. Ooh, yeah, I'm a 600 <laughs> level. I don't care about three seeds. <laughs> you know, big deal. You know, it's not you're not going to entice me for three seeds. But you don't have to kill everything. You should be able to get experience, not just the thief who does the trap, but he should get the majority. If he's the one that takes the majority of the risk, he should take the majority of the experience. If oh, it's wow. like the thief, you can the thief in a third level trap and he makes all three level rolls, everybody that is there, of course, shares in the experience. That's the camaraderie of D D. But the thief should get most of the points for that that thing. Nobody, yeah. nobody out there communicate that to Shane Noble because otherwise there's going to be huge arguments about whether he gets uh, Shane is the thief in my online campaign and he's going to pay very close attention to what you just said. <laughs> well, if he takes all the risk, he should get most of the benefit. Not all. It's got to give up like 25, 30% of the total to be shared amongst the rest of the group, all for one and one for all. But if somebody says, all right, I'll take the risk, I'll vault the chasm with a rope around my waist, you know, and all that, and they successfully make the rolls and then and, and pull the party's butt out of the fire, absolutely they're going to get points at the end of the game. Not for gold they found, but for daring do and things they did and um, skill, you know, small ass, small ass skills that they've they've honed, you know, and and I, there will be notes taken that they successfully did this vault, and so the next time they got to jump across a chasm of similar size, it'll be easier. Right. Having done it, so you know you don't have to kill everything to succeed, especially when you're trying to find the three parts of the rod of you know whoever, or you know the eyeball of Vecna or whatever. You don't have to kill everything. And if it's just pure, eyeball, out of, you know, if you are able to get to find the eyeball of Vecna by overcoming all the obstacles in your way, it doesn't it shouldn't matter if you killed them all, or tricked them, or sent them to another plane, or you know, caused them to kill themselves. Shouldn't matter. So you do experience entirely by what what I think a lot of people nowadays call mission mission bonuses, mission awards. Yeah. Yeah, I've always, I, I guess you'd call it that. I've always played that way. I, You know, yeah, you guys find a, a big hoard of money. Sure, everybody gets their share of the money, which I always felt, especially in the lower levels, you know, if you do luck out and everybody ends up with uh, 65 gold pieces, you know, second levels, third levels, 65 gold pieces ought to be a buttload of money because my, my economy has always kind of worked on uh, – uh, Wild West of the late eight and late nineteenth century, you know, a, a nice meal and, and a drink for uh, fifteen or twenty cents, you know, a silver and a half, two silvers. You know, I've always looked at silvers as kind of dimes, yeah, and, and golds as kind of dollars, and, and um, it was always, you know, you could get a good filling meal for ten or fifteen cents, or you could go into the bar and get a fifteen cent beer and fill up on cold cuts and bread, you know, whatever. So $65 was a windfall. Yeah. You know, now you're living in a better place. You're, you're associating with better people, wearing finer clothes. Yeah, well, $65 pays this month's rent. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know? And that's the other thing. Suck the money out of them, whatever, however you can. So they got to go get more. Right. Inflation is a wonderful thing. <laughs> all of a sudden, all that money comes into town, wherever town is. So oh. you're playing in the gold rush. Yes, then we do. Yeah, eggs, ninety gold. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> That's what you do. You go from you go from Dawson before the gold strike 
Dawson after the gold strike. All right. What's your next one? Um, all right. My last number five. No one to take your hands off the steering wheel. Or in this case, the analogy I like is we're all riding on a big multiple bicycle that steers both from the front and from the rear. It's a tandem, except it's a nine-tum or a ten-tum <laughs> octon bike, whatever. So know when it's okay for you to let the other guy steer. Let the party go where they will. You cannot possibly foresee, as the most assiduous, well-crafted dungeon master who spends three weeks working out these two incredibly intense levels that in total have 111 voids and areas and rooms in them, you cannot possibly foresee what everything the group's likely to do. They're going to take a turn that you weren't prepared for. Huh? What do you mean? Oh, I, I forgot that. <laughs> or they're going to do something. Okay, they're, they're going to do something. Let them do it. You've got the story outline laid out. Let the characters go where they will. Let them make a blunder. Don't have to let them kill themselves. But Unless you're Jim Ward. Well, then, yeah, Jim Jim has a boom. <laughs> I admire his technique. Um, <laughs> but I think that the hands-off at the end reinforces all the four, the four previous. Know when it's okay to let that guy who's got the handlebars in the front take the adventure down that side street. You don't know what kind of fun's waiting there. As long as you're not going to find somewhere that you didn't, oops, didn't finish. Because in an ongoing campaign, that happens all the time. Oh, yeah. No, no, it's all caved in uh, <laughs> three <laughs> weeks later. I, no, obviously, it's been cleaned out. Greyhawk Construction um, Company has this particular passageway blocked off for construction. Oh, Gary did that for years and years. He used the same levels over and over. Go down and kill all the orcs on the orc level and the gelatinous cubes and everything had come through and they clean them up. And three, four months later, Something new would be down on what was once the orc level, and they'd be repopulated. And so we go back down there again. And of course, it was mostly like it was the last time, but not always like it was the last time. So, you know, oh, that one caved in. So we'll have to find a way around or whatever. But if you let, if you know when it's okay to let them run with the ball, if it's not going to, if you're not letting the, the children run off the cliff, if you're not letting the puppies run into the electric fence, let them run. Right. It increases their fun because they, hey, like any puppy, ha -ha, running free. Now, they, let me ask you a question, though, because here sure. we're talking about tips for other DMs. And you're talking about something that you are capable of doing, which is letting a group of people run past the edge of the map. But what? Well, would you advise if you're a DM that has some difficulty with that? I mean, what are the creative? Well, okay, number one, all right, running off the edge of the map isn't always a good thing, and it's obviously not anything you want to happen at a con. Um, running, uh, phrase your question again, please. All right, it's um, when you, okay, let's so let's say that your group does go, you know, down the side alleyway that you were talking about in the city. And you, okay, and I haven't really developed what's down that alley. Exactly. That How alley do you, that's kind of seedy. Yeah, what's your thinking process? Let them go. Well, Let yeah, I know you said that, but the, but what do you, how do you figure out what it is that they're going to see when they come down there and then? By what no, they ask. Okay. By what they ask. If they give it an absolute eyeball, you know, a complete eyeball top to bottom, I'll describe the refuse in the corners. I'll describe the pools of vomit in the in in the in the center where the street's low. If I want to put a hook in there, I'll stick a hook in there, or I'll let them find absolutely nothing. If, if, if there's absolutely nothing there, that's fine. It's always their choice to go where they're going to go. If I haven't happened to develop it. Well, okay. Doesn't mean that they might. If I if I decide to develop that at a later date, doesn't mean they might chase somebody down there, right? And they go, oh, oh wait, this wasn't. Oh, this is all different. Um, if 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 you're not comfortable with letting them run with it, um, the best example that I can get is, you put them in the middle of the where you want the adventure hook to start. 
and there's three rays that you really, really hope that they go, and you you do everything you can to make them enticing and and suck them down there. And for some odd reason, somebody decides they want to go down this disused passageway over on the left side. Okay. Let them go. And they'll find there was nothing there. It was just something you put in to waste their time. Now, one of the things, I mean, because um, you're I describing time wasters. You, one of the things you've described, though, in your process is something, and it's, uh, I think it was Brendan LaSalle who did it in his five, was to visualize. And so what you just described was that you go down the alleyway, you may see the pool of vomit, you may see the, uh, you know, the refuse in the corner. And if you are really visualizing that, it may come up to you that the pool of vomit is actually the top of an O tube that's going to come up, you know, if they go in. Is that kind of the... Well, the procedure you're talking about? No, I'm more. I'm more. Um, if they got down somewhere that I hadn't finished, I would have it to be a dead end. And then the next time they went down and there was something else, I go, "What do you mean there was something there?" Well, there was a magic <laughs> it. it hit it. You know, there was a hidden wall there. But you know, <laughs> you're the DM. You can make up any kind of crap you want. Yeah. All right. Don't let them running into a dead end derail you. Theater of the mind. I tried something once, and and apparently. Uh, it was it was more than people were willing for. I was writing um, in an adventure about this cave that was literally constructed of multifaceted crystals. And I, I wrote the DM and description as envision the most amazing underground cavern you've ever seen with the light coruscating back and forth and flashing everywhere you've ever seen. That should have been enough. If they'd have closed their mind or closed their eyes and gone to the theater of their mind, whatever cavern that they had seen somewhere in a picture, on a tour, on TV, in a movie, would have clicked in. That's what I like to trigger is that theater of the mind. I like to give those kinds of descriptions. If you could look into those four minds listening to that description and paint what each of them sees, it's not exactly the same, but it's all generally the same. Yeah. And yeah. that's what theater to their mind is about. You got six people picturing this cavern, two of them, it might be a, a spectacular one in Carlsbad because they've been there. And the other four will be some, just some cavern they've seen or saw on TV, you know, or whatever. Um, I don't think we rely on theater of the mind enough as DMs. And if we did, we could save ourselves a lot of work because <laughs> we wouldn't have to write out 60 word descriptions of how the light bounces off those walls and blinds you. And, you know, and all the clues we're trying to give them about don't shoot lightning, don't, don't throw anything in here. You know, all these things, all these adjectives and adverbs you're putting in there trying to tell them bad idea, bad idea, bad idea. You know, just. Let them let them see it in their mind. Yeah, maybe it's a scene out of the Conan movie with all the mirrors, with the beast and the red cape. Yep, mm -hmm. it's still what you're looking for. Light coming from everywhere, confusion coming from all over. You know, you, the theater of the mind. We don't play theater of the mind often enough, and that's why I like what I'm doing now because I'm being forced to play theater of the mind, and I drag them along with me. Everybody's got lots of cures and. They've got uh, the party, for however number of the party, they've got half that many uh, universal anecdotes, 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 no, that'd be fun. But, you know, they glue body halves together and the adventure goes on um, because we're, we're there to play in our, play in our head. Imagine a guy, and this was a big feller. He's about 6'4", sort of husky. And, um, of course, gruffy, you know, that whatever they call that three days growth of beard thing. Um, he decides that the best way to achieve their goal is he, he describes his character as stripping naked and you can cover me with that honey so that all those tens of thousands of oversized butterflies will come down and lift me up over the thorn hedge. And that's what they, he did, and they did, and he got over, and everybody went nuts. Yeah, that's great. You got to the plans that people come up that's with. That's all theater of the mind. I did not want to know what those other scenes things people saw of this guy being lifted by 10,000 butterflies over the hedge. 
I did not want to go into a description of what he looked like. I just let them all see that in their mind. Because the funny thing is, of you course, that you don't. So lewd, so you, fast. you can cover yourself in honey when you are still dressed. Too. <laughs> yeah, but he had to do it this way. He didn't want to ruin his armor. <laughs> I just okay, hey, you know, whatever floats your boat, buddy. You know, and it worked. We, that was one of those times people walking by wonder what we were roaring with laughter about. But you know, let him run once in a while. Let him go down that other that other corridor. Um, make up something on the spot that's either impassable or so horrendous. They're not even going to try and mess with it. What do you think down there? I don't know, but I see two piles of ogre poop. Oh, I don't feel like fasting. I didn't have my Wheaties this morning. Ogres, you say? Well, I'll wait for another day when there's four more of us. <laughs> yeah. And that, that's the trick, too, to the old school of play is it's okay to run away and fight another day. Yeah, it absolutely is. That's, yeah, uh, that, that's, that's probably the, on the top five player uh, skill list. Well, you know, have, have fun. Keep it simple. Get everybody involved. Don't have to kill everything. And let the party run every once in a while. They'll enjoy it. You'll enjoy it, even if it's in the most sardonic and twisted <laughs> you know, those dumb buggers <laughs> yeah, you'll enjoy it i'm telling you you'll enjoy it for the worst reasons you'll enjoy it and hey we need fuel once in a while too you know absolutely there. all right well we've done an hour um just Holy about cow, so I guess let's, uh, yeah let's go ahead and, and and wrap it up because you just gave us an awesome finale where you summed, <laughs> you summed everything you know. up and then you got really sinister right at the end <laughs> You know, so well, like, I'm still capable wow. of the case, yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Tim. So uh, uh, thank you, everybody, for watching. Thank you, Tim, for being on the show. Yeah, it was my pleasure. My fun. And uh, we'll say to everybody, imagine whatever kind of Dungeons & Dragons it is that you play, imagine the hell out of it. <laughs>